Hey, what is up guys? So I was thinking since Fallout 4's last piece of DLC is right around the corner, we'd go over some of my most memorable quests in Fallout, just to see if any of Nuka Worlds could top them. And for today we're going to be taking a look at my top 5 favorite quests from Fallout 3, which to this day still remains my favorite Fallout game. Not because it's necessarily better than any of the others, but because it was the first one I ever got to play and some of the best memories I have were made while playing it. And since I'm getting sort of a Paradise Falls vibe from the latest Nuka World trailer, I figured what better to start with than Rescue from Paradise. Not only is this quest one of my favorites, but it also takes place in one of the game's most memorable locations. At least when I initially heard about Paradise Falls in my first playthrough, I thought it would be a nice escape from the hostilities of the wasteland. The fuck you looking at, huh? But little did I know it was run by slavers and that the giant statue of a boy holding an ice cream cone was more so of a warning sign than it was a symbol of hope. For me, even just getting into Paradise Falls was sort of a challenge my first time through. For any goody two-shoes out there, you may want to let your caps do the talking. I think 500 caps should cover it. What do you say? Otherwise, if you want in, you're either going to have to fight your way through or just become a part-time slaver yourself. Hmm, maybe I could use someone like you. Think you can round up some assets for Eulogy Jones? Might get you into paradise. And whether you've been following the main quest or just stumbled across this place randomly, you might find yourself needing to free a few slaves. Hey, mister, can you get us out of here? One of the main reasons I love this quest is just because it gives you so many options. You'll either have to hack Eulogy's terminal or try and rewire the junction box to somehow reconnect the network to that little brat named Squirrel. Gee, thanks. Don't work too hard, okay? But it doesn't end there. There's also a guard named Forty that still stands watch and obviously needs to be dealt with. Once again, you have plenty of options such as just simply killing him, getting into his head, or even having one of Eulogy's girls seduce him. Maybe it's time that changed. Maybe I go see Eulogy about that right now, in fact. Now, you'd think it would end there, but another challenge arises when a girl named Penny tells you she won't leave without her friend Rory, who just so happens to be locked in the box. Nuh-uh. Not without Rory. You gotta get him out of the box. You just gotta. They've got keys for it somewhere. That Mungo Forty has one. I don't know where the other one is. His boss probably has it somewhere. You get Rory out and I'll leave. Not until then. And depending on your morals, you could convince the kids to either leave Penny or Rory behind, or if you're feeling brave enough, you'll need to steal a key, most likely through some pickpocketing. Even if you successfully manage to get the key, the theme of the quest continues with one challenge leading to another, and sneaking Rory out becomes the next task at hand, in which you have the option to kill him yourself and be done with him, or you could just make a run for it. Otherwise, you'll have to be quite crafty or be willing to put up a fight against the other slavers if you want to help Rory survive. You got it. I'll stay right with you. Get me to the front gate and I can make a run for it from there. And I'll admit, once all the children are free, there isn't really much of a reward for this quest, but I'd say the tense experience alone was worth all the trouble. Next up we have the Superhuman Gambit. And if the name of the quest wasn't interesting enough, just wait till you meet the Mechanist and the Antagonizer. This quest takes place in a little town called Canterbury Commons, which in a way has become a battleground for two wannabe supers. And after accepting the quest from Uncle Roe, you can simply go hunt down the two troublemakers, or if you so choose, you can also do a little digging. Uncle Roe can tell you a bit more about the Mechanist's background and also shares with you the main reason the Mechanist wants vengeance. Guy used to take care of a robot that protected the town until it got torn up in one of the ant agonizer's lame little attacks. I guess he took it personal because he made a mechanical suit and called himself the Mechanist, said he would lead a robot army to fight her. But through speaking with him, you also learn that the Mechanist has become a bigger problem than the antagonizer ever was. There's also the option to talk to Roy's nephew and he'll tell you a little bit more about each of the town's enemies and where you can find them but also how he looks up to him, and this originally left me feeling sympathy for the two outlaws that might have just been misunderstood. I don't know much about her except she really, really doesn't like people. 
That's kind of cool. I mean, sometimes people are jerks. This is another quest that gives you plenty of options when it comes to dealing with the problem, although no matter where you start, I recommend hearing both sides of the story. You'll find the antagonizer north of the town in what seems to be more of a bunker, rather than just some old cave, and plenty of ants guard their queen, but once you actually find her, she is still human enough to talk. So at last, you've penetrated the court of the Antagonizer, Queen of All Ants! It's here that you can either kill her, take her side, or try and sort out some kind of peaceful resolution. Either of the two menaces can be talked into giving up their costumes and putting their conflict aside, but just make sure if you do choose to kill one of them and take their costume, that you don't wear it into the other's secret lair. So, Mechanist, you've come to throw yourself on the mercy of the Ant Queen? Very well. We shall grant you the kindest of our gifts for any human. A swift death. Even for me, this is the first time I found out that doing so would result in pretty much tricking them into thinking you were their arch nemesis. And this outcome can potentially occur at both the Antagonizer's Lair and the Mechanist's Forge, which for me was a joy to explore, especially after playing Automatron not too long ago. I found there were actually quite a few similarities. So with plenty of outcomes and a possible 600 caps waiting for you at the end, this quest still remains one of my favorites from Fallout 3. That's grand. I do believe it's fair to say you've saved Canterbury. And unlike that mechanist, you did so with significantly less stress all around. Third on the list is Tempenny Tower, which also takes place in another memorable location, and unlike Paradise Falls, this hotel actually is shielded from the horrors of the wasteland. Almost so much that it bores the tower's owner. Fancy that! A visitor! I seldom get visitors, which is a tiresome shame, because I'm usually relentlessly bored out of my right mind. But upon approaching the tower, you'll notice things might not be as simple as they seem, depending on how you feel about ghouls. I can stand here all day yelling at you through this damn speaker if I have to. I've already told you Tenpenny won't allow zombies to live here. Who the hell are you calling a zombie? For this one, following the ghoul outside the gate will only show you another barrier between them and their smooth-skinned neighbors. So should you want to investigate even further, you'll need to talk to one of the tower's guards, named Gustavo. That damn Roy Phillips won't take no for an answer. Keep showing up, looking for a handout. Keenest kind aren't wanted. End of story. After talking to him and some of the other residents, their hatred for the ghouls really starts to show, and you could find yourself doing their dirty work, should you choose to go deal with the ghouls yourself. And shortly after discovering a new way into the metro tunnels, I found myself regretting taking the job in the first place. Not only because I felt bad for the ghouls, but also due to the numerous amounts of ferals between me and Roy's gang. But once you finally do stumble across Roy, there are a decent amount of ways to go about the quest. You can either take the easy way out and kill him then and there, although after becoming good friends with Gob and finding sympathy for the ghouls, I just couldn't bring myself to pull the trigger. So that leaves you with two options, either find a peaceful way to go about things, which involves plenty of convincing, or help the ghouls sneak into the tower and let them have the payback they've been seeking for being left out to rot. I already got a plan. They think I'm a monster, I'll show them the real monsters. Should you choose this route, you'll need to steal a key to the generator room below the tower in order to let the ghouls in. Great job, kid. Meet me around front. I have something for you to keep the ferals from gnawing on your ass. But even though it may seem as though you've done the right thing, the horrors that come next might leave you feeling otherwise. Although I will say you do get one of the game's most useful and unique items for doing so your very own ghoul mask. What I like about this point in the quest is that you can either just leave or watch the mess unfold right before your very eyes and see for yourself a building that looks more like the ruins of downtown DC than an old five-star hotel. Overall, the three very different outcomes and potential badass mask are what have left me loving this quest even to this day. Next up, we'll be heading all the way back to Vault 101 for a quest called Escape, which has you do exactly what it says as you are tasked with escaping the vault. And for me, the build-up before this quest really helps the emotional side of things. 
Especially when news of Jonas's death reaches you? I thought so too, but... It's true, he's gone, and Jonas is dead, and now they're looking for you! And with more than enough ways of going about this mission, it's really up to you to decide whether you just plan on getting the hell out, or seek revenge as well. With so many possibilities, none of my playthroughs during this quest have ever been the same. In fact, up until recently, I never knew you could let Amada keep her father's gun, which honestly proves to be quite useful. Watch out, sir, she's got a gun! Amada, where did you get that gun? Just get away from me! I don't want to shoot you, but I will! I swear I will! How dare you threaten me! And with my own gun! I'm your father, damn you, and you'll show me some respect! Officer Mac, don't just stand there! Don't make me take that gun away from you, girlie. Just hand it over. Nice and easy now. No! Get away from me! Oh my god, a martyr! And as you move about the vault, you really find out who your true friends are, and whether or not you want to become a killer yourself. I don't know what you're up to, and I, I don't want to know. Just, just clear out of here, and I'll pretend I never saw you. Whether you choose to fight the guards, or leave them to the rad roaches, is really up to you the whole way through. And when you're finally confronted by your childhood bully Butch, the power is all in your hands, leaving you with the option to get payback, save his mom, or even handing over your own BB gun to let him deal with the problem. Look. I'm sorry for the way I've always treated you. You know I never meant any of it, right? But it's my mom. You can't leave her in there with the rad roaches. What's great about this situation and the quest as a whole is that the choices you make not only change the outcome of the present situations, but also how things will end up should you decide to return to the vault later on. For instance, killing the overseer will leave Amada hating you, and when you return, a new overseer will have taken power. So good luck reloading that save should you not like the outcome. In my eyes, this quest not only prepares you for what's to come, but also foreshadows the horrors of the wasteland, which can be seen as the guards back off instead of chasing you out the vault. And once that giant vault door slid shut, it really gave me the feeling of being truly alone in a new world. What makes this quest even greater for me is that it leads to my favorite quest of all time, following in his footsteps. It's during this mission that you take your first steps in the wasteland. For me, the feeling was almost undescribable the first time I played it. Not to mention, this quest also led me to a lot of the game's more memorable locations, such as Springvale and Megaton. Once inside Megaton, the player really gets a sense of law in the wasteland. The quiet type, huh? Fine. Might help keep you out of trouble. I hope you're not a weirdo. Got enough of those already. And it's where you meet many of the game's more interesting characters, such as Mr. Burke. My, my. Just when I had all but given up hope. My dear boy, I'm very happy to make your acquaintance. I am Mr. Burke. And where you most likely stumble across your first ghoul. Something? Come on, you piece of junk. Every day it's the same damn thing. I told you, Gob, it ain't the radio. The Enclave station comes in fine. It's Galaxy News. Their signal's been shit lately. Now, depending on your morals, you can either befriend a Gob and possibly gain information about your father, or treat him like most of the other customers do. Hey, smooth skin. You need something? A drink, maybe? Anything? Anything at all? And I feel like how you go about this first encounter can really dictate how you treat other ghouls throughout the game, such as the ones near Tempany Tower. Which for me really gave the encounter some real weight and meaning. I'm used to every asshole smooth skin in this town giving me shit just because I look like a corpse. I'm glad to see that there are a few worthwhile people around here. Moving further in the quest, you'll most likely find yourself needing to talk to Moriarty, the saloon's owner. That is, unless you're rather skilled at hacking terminals. But if not, you'll need to trick Moriarty, and if that's not your thing, then you could always try buying him off, which may result in needing to track down someone who owes him money and either get the caps or just flat out put a bullet in her head. Once again, just the amount of options and depth to these quests is why I continue to enjoy them so much. He headed southeast into the city. Said he needed information from those loanies at the station. You know, Galaxy News Radio. What there is of it. After learning your father is traveling to GNR, the game will take you through even more memorable locations and 
although not all of them are tied to the quest. Let's be honest, who the hell wouldn't go explore the Super Duper Mart? And I'll be the first to admit, back when I first played Fallout 3, I thought the metro tunnels were extremely creepy and given that this quest put me through my first one ever, I found myself getting lost more than I would have liked. It was here that I encountered my first feral ghouls and as much as I liked Gob, I knew these were better dead than alive. When you finally do get out of the tunnels, you'll be in what's more or less the heart of the DC ruins. This is where I ended up encountering my first super mutants and thankfully was rescued by Sarah Lyons and was pretty much put to shame by how good her and the Brotherhood were at killing these big ugly beasts. But nonetheless, I was thankful they let me tag along. You've been living under a rock? This is DC. The entire city is crawling with super mutants. Now if you'll excuse me. The battle from there to GNR was fun, but also showed me what would happen if I wasn't careful enough. But when I finally made it to GNR in one piece, I really got a sense of accomplishment and felt as if I was more than just dead weight to the Brotherhood. Well, until you know what. Continuing with the theme of seeing things for the first time, I encountered my first super mutant behemoth. And after taking the beast down with what could be considered a lucky shot with a mini nuke, I didn't feel like a child in the wasteland anymore, but more so someone who might actually make it out there. And apparently, I wasn't the only one. I guess it's my turn to thank you. Anyway, the area's secure, so you're free to talk to Three Dog if you need to. Last, but certainly not least, I got to venture into GNR and was able to meet Three Dog, who was not only an apparent friend of my father, but just one of the game's coolest characters in general. I mean, the guy's the host of GNR for crying out loud. The look on your face says it all. You're wondering who the heck this guy is and why you should care. Well, prepare to be enlightened. I am Three Dog. Now, the outcome of this conversation can go a variety of different ways, and as nice as Three Dog was, he doesn't give away information for free. But anyways, guys, thanks for watching. I really do hope you enjoyed this one, so make sure and let me know what you thought down in the comments. And I'm also really curious to know what your favorite quests were, or how you handled some of the ones shown here. But once again, thanks for watching, and as always, I will see you in the next one.